Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. We knew we were running in the game. You know, it, it's not like some schemes when you just practicing things, you're never gonna call it. So when we practice things in practice, everybody was competing to see who ran the route the best, because we knew whoever ran the route the best, that's who Coach Spurs gonna call it for in the game. So that that brought a lot of competition between the team, which made us better as a team. Today we have our sixth episode in our passing lab series. It's been a fun series so far. And our host, Josh Herring, has done a great job. So, Josh, thank you for all you've done here. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, it's been great. I've enjoyed it, too. So, today, we have Coach Jaquez Green from Manatee High School. He's the head coach there, but he retains play calling duties and offensive coordinator duties. And he's an interesting one because he's got some deep historical coaching influences directly from guys we all know. Yeah, absolutely. Coach Green was a legend as a player, both in high school and in college at the University of Florida. But as a coach, if you want to talk about the strength of a coaching tree, he played in college for Coach Steve Spurrier and then in the NFL for John Gruden. So that's that's pretty strong as far as uh, your coaching roots go. Definitely. It's another great one here on the Passing Lab. And we'll have our winning edge takeaways for this one at the end of the interview. So here's Passing Lab with head coach at Manatee, Jaquez Green. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, A player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512-814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. All right, I want to welcome everybody to the Passing Lab podcast. I'm really excited about tonight's guest. It's going to be a good one. I know you guys are going to be excited to hear. We've got an SEC legend, a unanimous All-American wide receiver and kick returner NFL player, was also in high school, by the way, guys, was a Peach County great. Peach County, a school that beat the brakes off us this season. It was not good for me personally, but, but Coach was is a legend there as well. But spent time in the NFL as a wide receiver, a very successful high school offensive coordinator, and is now the head coach at Manatee High School in Florida. We've got Jacquez Green here on the pod with us. Coach, we are super excited to have you on. Coach, I appreciate you having me on. But we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you a bunch of stuff related. You've got a lot of experience from a lot of different coaches, kind of in the passing game. And being a high school coach, having played the game at the highest level, the schemes that you're running and the stuff you're doing at Manatee, who have been kind of influential guys in your career, whether it be high school, college, or NFL, on kind of the scheme you run, or maybe your coaching philosophy and how you think about the passing game. No, I think about the passing game. I've been lucky to be around some guys that can really throw the football. You know, back in college, it was Coach Spurrier. In the NFL, I was at camp with Tampa Bay with Coach Gruden. And before that, I played in Detroit with Coach Marty Morningwig. You know, Morningwig was a West Coast guy also like Coach Gruden. And I really learned the West Coast offense a lot, you know, playing on those guys because Gruden can coach that scheme inside and out. 
I right. learn how simple some pass routes can be in the end of the field, yet someone can always be open, no matter what the defense does. Uh, so I learned a lot of that type of stuff in the West Coast game. And with Coach Spurrier, I learned you can be real simple and can really, you know, throw the ball vertical. And so I, I guess with the West Coast, I learned a lot of horizontal stretches. And with Coach Spurrier, I learned a lot of vertical stretches in the passing game. So I try to have a little combination of both, you know, when I throw the football oh, nowadays. That's really interesting. So you mentioned Coach Spurrier, and I know a lot of guys, I've had some guys say stuff about, hey, I wish you could have, you know, something about his passing game. So uh, something that I've always thought, I mean, I've been influenced by a lot of air raid guys, but and everybody sort of remembers, okay, air raid guys bringing a passing game into the SEC, and they forget that Coach Spurrier really was a guy who opened it up and threw the ball all over the place well before that and the fun and gun days that you were a part of. But I, And I really think a lot of the stuff that Coach Spurrier was doing was ahead of its time. And because maybe he, he he's not known for a tree like some of these guys, you know, where people are just running his exact system and, and kind of these guys branch off. And maybe that's because of kind of how new, unique he was. What is it about what you guys were doing at Florida that you think Coach Spurrier was so ahead of his time? You talked about the simplicity and the vertical stretches, but what, why do you think it was so unique and so successful at that time? Obviously, y'all had good players like <laughs> yourself, and he did a good job of recruiting, but also clearly there was a lot to the coaching part of it as well. So talk yeah. to us about that. Well, people forget now Spurrier won the, the ACC at Duke also, so he, he was a winner right. way before he came to the University of Florida. But Spurrier just knew how to export coverages, man. He just knew how to uh, put guys in certain parts of the field and, and, and make make this guy wrong every time as far as defenders. And, and one thing we did that most teams don't really do now is the wire receivers and the quarterbacks, we met together every single day. It was no gray area right. in the passing game. The quarterback didn't have to say he thought this, or the receivers didn't have to say he thought that. You know, we knew the protections, just like the quarterback knew the protections. And as you alluded to earlier, he was just way ahead of his time. You know, if you look back at our old film, we was doing no huddle. We was actually doing like a mother huddle. The linemen to get on the ball and we'll get the receivers to just get our eyes to the sideline. We'll get the signal to line up and go. So we was really doing a lot of no huddle, uh, mother huddle type things way back in those days. But Spurry was a guy, you know, he was aggressive. He believed in attacking. And when we practiced things in practice, we knew we were running in the game. You know, it, it's not like some schemes when you're just practicing things, you're never going to call it. So when we practice things in practice, everybody was competing to see who ran the route the best because we knew whoever ran the route the best, that's who Coach Spurrier was going to call it for in the game. So that that brought a lot of competition between the team, which made us better as a team. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier, we all met together. And so we all knew protection. And so, you know, our means were very – you know, Spur was always asked questions during the meeting. So, you know, you had to always pay attention to what it means. He may come to me and be like, Quez, what's three good pass routes against cover three this week? And so I had to be on it knowing what's three good pass routes this week versus cover three. And so that made everybody else pay attention to the meetings because you never knew which guy he was going to call on that particular day. So uh, and it also gave us a chance to, to learn protections. So he will ask Danny, the quarterback at the time, he'd be like, Danny, if they bring seven, what can we get to protection wise to protect it? And that gave me a head start on coaching. So that's how I really learned protections right there, was listening to him go over protection with the quarterback each week in the, in the team meeting. On, I think it was that Friday before we do walkthrough, before Saturday game. So we'll go through protections and, and, and checks and all that kind of stuff. So it taught me about protection, and it showed me that it was more than just running pass routes. You know, if we couldn't protect it up and get it protected up well enough, we couldn't throw the ball down the field. And he also taught me how to attack coverages. You know, I think he, he was the best at that drawing up plays and get people like wide open. No, it was no contested type catches. He knew how to put people or he knew how to motion to get guys wide open. So I really appreciate that a lot. You no, know, just looking back on him and I, I used a lot of that stuff in, in high school. Yeah, that is so good because you think about, you know, from a wide receiver perspective, a lot, those guys, they have their own things they're thinking about. And you're not necessarily – sometimes those guys don't necessarily understand what it is that the quarterback's thought process or what he's dealing with in protection and hots and side adjusts and things like that. So to have them understand the protection aspect of that, I mean, that's really, really good. I think that's very beneficial for high school coaches out there in understanding this is, you know, this total concept of what a pass is. That's really good. Now, get, correct me if I'm wrong, another thing that you guys were doing – that was kind of advanced for the time is reading routes on the run as far as like, you know, I know that he had some of the stuff. I think it was Ronnie or, or Lonnie or Ralph, you know, Ralph, it's R&L Ralph, word. Lonnie. 
Ralph and Lenny. Yeah. So Lenny was similar to what teams are doing now with the choice routes on the outside. Right. Only different was we'll inside release. And if it's cover three, we'll go a 15 yard and curl it up. So it turned to a flat curl, which is always good against cover three. If they right. rolled the right. two, we'll go to the corner route. And the flat is over a flat and a corner route, which is good against cover two. So the defense could be right no matter what. So we was ahead of our time as far as doing that, like reading routes on the run or, or running option routes. Our four vert game was, you know, everybody talked about Mike Leach in the four vert game. That was a lot of bread and butter, throwing four verts down the field. And we did it so many different ways of throwing four verts. We even threw a corner route out the right slot, a cover two post out the left slot, and a backside go route. On the on the boundary outside, I got to run a go route down the left sideline. So we knew how to stress coverages a lot, you know. And, and, and Spur, he just was smart, you know. And he was the type of co- coach that if he sees something doing the game, he'll make an adjustment and call it right there during the game. He'll go on the sideline, tell him, this is what we're going to do right now. Instead of quiz, instead of you doing this right here, I want you to do this right here. And, you know, it'd be a touchdown. So every time we made an adjustment during the game, we really believed in what he was, he was saying and we knew it'd be a touchdown if we ran the routes correctly. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. You played for Spurrier, who's a great offensive mind, John Gruden. And you, you mentioned these guys. Clearly, there's some things that they learn, that you learn from them, you could take to the high school level. And then there's some things, you know, like Gruden's play calls. Uh, they're linked, which is famous, you know, and you see the stuff on NFL films about uh, there's the famous Chris Sims scene where Chris Sims is trying to spit out those play calls. But how, how did you take things from guys like that and adapt them to what you're dealing with, because you know, uh, as I do, it's a whole different level, but football is football still. How did you take things that you learned from those guys and kind of adapt it to the high school level, or or, or maybe you have it? See, in, in, in the professional level, uh, you have to make so many adjustments week to week because the defenses are so good. And, you know, in the high school level, we just can call one player a concept, and everybody knows what to do. Right, but in right. the pros, you may have a concept, but this week you may want – the X to run a different route as opposed to what he usually run. Instead of naming a brand new concept in the pros, they just say shark, X, whatever, X post or whatever. It was so much easier than naming a brand new concept. And the next week, you may still want to run your shark concept, but you may want to run the X post, but you may want to change the running back route this week. So now it'll be shark, X post, H option. But it was, it was it's easier for the pros for us to remember it that way because that's all we do all day long. It's not like college or high school where you only have so much time to be with the players. So we, we spend 6 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock in the evening at the facility, and it's all football. So it's really easy to learn for us, and it's, it's no great area in there, and you don't have to worry about you know, as much communication because he's telling the receiver exactly what route to run. If you got a $100, $100 million receiver and he doesn't learn – well, and the only way you can teach him is tell him exactly what route to run, you're going to do that because you want him to yeah. be successful. And that's the, that's the difference in the pros and, and college football. I think the thing when you're dealing with high school kids, all right, we know we, you guys have really good players in Florida. I'm in Georgia. so We know that you guys need to get paid more. We, we all know <laughs> that, right? That's that's a huge thing right now that, that, that you Florida guys, we, we got we to gotta do something about this, Coach. But you got great athletes, but you're also seeing great athletes. And so how, you know, passing game wise, is there something that you really like that you think regardless of what athletes you have, you're going to run this at whatever program you run? Maybe you've carried it from program to program. There's a passing concept that you just really like and has become like sort of just a pass that's going to be every day. We're going to carry this like you're talking about, about being able to just carry these concepts. What is a concept in high school you really like? 
Some concepts I carry no matter what. You know, always one of the first, you know, day one or day two installs is your, your typical snag concept. You know, it's always going to be a corner snag with a wide or a flat route. And I attack something on backside, you know, some kind of built-in hide or something in case we get a blitz out the backside edge. So the quarterback has to worry about that. Because if you get a blitz out the front side edge, you already got places you can go with the football. So I may build something on backside. Or I may build something if a team plays too high and they give us a too high, I might make it a Mike linebacker read. You know, if he, he runs hard to the snag, I may put something on the backside to get a two-on-one on the wheel linebacker. So snag is one. But I try to put routes in the, the concepts in early on that are real flexible. Stick is another one I try to use early on. And probably the drive concept. You know, this year I went to more of a shallow concept, which is the basic and the shallow coming from different sides of the field. Uh, historically, I've been a drive guy where I bring the drive and the basic from the same side of the field. But I also tag something, some kind of route uh, coverage beater to the back side. So we check coverage beater and try to throw that. If it's not there, if it's not there, we always come back to the drive. And in our mind, the drive can always save the play. It can always save the play. So say we'll have, say we play on a cover two team. I may put smash to the backside. Quarterback check smash. If he doesn't like it, he come back to the drive. So it'd be drive basic to a check three by three. And a three wow. by three check is to me is when the back goes three yards outside the tackle, three yards deep. So we always come back to that particular triangle. And as you know, most passing games, you're just forming triangles out there. Say we get a cover three out there. I may just put a sail right out there. I may put a goal with a sail right outside. If we don't have that or the uh, weak side linebacker sinking up on the cell, then we can throw drive basic back to three by three, back out the backfield. So I try to use real flexible routes that good against, you know, regardless of what the coverage is. And also I try to put one or two routes that are just cover specific routes. You know, if the team sees this, my guys will tell me, coach, we need to run this because they know what's going on. And they know this route gives this defense, particular defense, trouble. So I want, I want a few coverage beaters and I want a few routes that are good regardless of what the defense plays yeah that's that's great that's great advice I, I think that's good advice for anybody to start out calling plays and trying to learn about passing game if you have something like drive that's universal that allows you the flexibility to tag stuff and beat different coverages but always have that you know security blanket for a quarterback that's that's when you can get really good at the passing game you mentioned snag I want to talk about that for a quick second because I think snag now is so universal. It's like it's like zone and verticals. Everybody runs it, but if you have five coaches get on the board and start talking about it, they're all going to have these slight changes and nuances. Yep. So how do you read snag? Because every guy I talk to has a different philosophy on how to read snag, and it's so good for so many people. It's been really good for us, but it seems like everybody I talk to has a different take on how you should read snag. So how are you guys reading snag at Manatee? I read most most of my plays. I read such as snag and stick. I read outside in. Okay, uh, okay. So the reason why I read outside in because we run it with a swing and a, and a sit down at six yards inside the flat defender. And the reason why I do that, because if we have the wide route right now, we throw it. But if the flat defender has taken it away, it'll bring us to the snag route right there. Some teams read it differently, but I, I don't like to throw the wide route late because sometimes the high school quarterbacks just don't have the arm to throw that route out there late. Because some people read it snag to you out to your flat or snag to your wide. Also, another coaching point, if we get too high and he gets ready to throw the wide and, and the corner clamps down, his eyes should automatically go to the corner route, to throw the corner route. So that's basically our main teaching on snag. And we teach the snag guy to get inside shoulder to the flat defender. You know, he can't get too far inside. If he get too far inside, the mic will be able to play him so much easier without getting far too far over. So we read wide to snag. And we'll alert the corner if the corner we'll alert the corner route if the corner jumps the corner and we know it's too high. Right. Those that's, those are great. We're we're kindred spirits when it comes to how to read this. And then <laughs> that being able to read it that way and stick and snag becomes such a pair that where it's easy for the quarterback and you're getting two different looks. And I love reading it that way. And you can always go back. Like I, a lot of guys, I think, get caught up in the corner so much. If you really want to throw a corner, there's lots of ways to throw a corner out. You know, yeah. but allowing that corner to protect the snag in the flat, I think, is what really opens it up and, and getting that ball out fast. And that's a great point snag, about snag, snag I, is just a high percentage throw to us. We just want to get the ball yeah. in the quarterback hand fast and and hit a quick a quick five yard pass. As as you said earlier, if we want to throw smash, I got a million other different ways we're trying to hit a smash route against cover two. 
Yeah, that's great stuff. I, I agree totally, and I think that that's something, especially at the high school level. You're, you're talking about the high school quarterback's arm, being able to get the ball. A, a lot of times, I mean, our best players in high school a lot of times are backs. So let's get the back – let's get a dude the ball early – in the flat and let him do stuff with it. And I think that's something that's just an underrated thing you point out about, you know, throwing running backs the ball in the high school passing game is really, you see it so much in the NFL and you hear about third down backs, but people forget you can do more than just hand it off to your best athlete in high school too. So I'm always trying to find ways to get to the back in the passing game. Most linebackers not good. Most linebackers in high school drop maybe two yards, just watch the quarterback. So it don't really get much depth. So you got some real good matchups in that area as far as uh, coverage wise on uh, linebackers on your running backs. Yeah. G- great point. Great point. Coach, there's so much good stuff here. So we're going to, I want to be conscious of your time and we're, we're going to wrap up. So we've got, we're kind of to the point of our, a silly portion of this thing. So everybody wants to know, you know, offense coordinators, head coaches that call plays, you know, th- there's a lot of different stereotypes about what they drink before the game. You got your Red Bull guys, your coffee guys, whatever. So for a, a coach like you, let, let's, let, we just want to know, during the game, are you a visor guy? Are you a hat guy? Are you nothing on your head during the game? What are you during the game as far as your headwear goes? I'm a visor guy. I like wearing visors. I like having my hair out, let my hair breathe. Now, if it's starting to rain, I got. I usually have a hat in my bag so I can put my hat on it if it's starting to rain. But usually I'm a visor guy. Okay, you're carrying on that spur of your tradition. I hear you, Coach. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. You got to pay homage. That's Four good. The coach uh, like that, that played for Spur and all those were visors, as a matter of fact, which is funny. <laughs> That's great. That's great. What's your what's your pregame drink of choice or maybe during the game? Now, you're you're a head coach now. This may have changed for you. Were you when you were an OC? Were you a box guy or on the field guy? I did both, man. I, I tried to be a box guy. I see it better. I just can't I can't feel the vibe of the team as much in the box. Uh, it's been plenty of times I go up in the box the first half and by second quarter, I'm down on the sideline. <laughs> I like the box a lot, but I, I just, you know, my players be needing me down there. You know, they, the whole vibe is different when I'm on the sideline. I communicate a lot better and a lot clearer when I'm on the sideline. The the best thing for me is to get me a guy in the box who really knows what we're trying to do on offense and has a good feel for football and can really see it without, you know, just watching the game, can really see what's going on with the game and, and see what they're trying to do uh, defensively. Because I can see the secondary for the most part. I just need somebody to tell me how close the corners are. Because from the from the area I, I, I am, I can't really tell how close they are. It looks three yards to me. It could be seven yards up top. So, and and, and I need a guy who showed me what the defensive front's looking like. You know, other than that, I can I have a good feel for what's going on down there, and I can I can see it pretty good right now. I'm getting older, so eventually I'm gonna have to put glasses on on the side. <laughs> Tell me, what's the biggest adjustment for you? You're still calling plays as the head coach? Yes. All right, so what's been the biggest adjustment you've had to deal with from going from being a coordinator to being the head coach and being on the sideline? Like, is there anything surprising? Or or maybe you knew it was going to happen, but it's just been an adjustment for you. I think the best thing that has happened to me in the past was I've always coached with defensive head coaches. So I've always always had to manage the game and call the game from a – kind of from a defensive head coach perspective. You no, know, I couldn't never get just crazy throwing it all over the place or nothing like that. And that always carried me. That always been the way I've called games. I, I still believe in running the football. Uh, most people think because I play for Coach Spurrier that I just want to throw it all over the lot. I believe in running the football, and I believe in just being efficient in the passing game. If we throw the ball between 15 and 18 times, we usually win the game. You no, know, when I get into the 25, 35 times, that means we're down and we have having to throw it around a lot. So, I haven't had to adjust as much because I've always coached under guys who, you know, guys I respected a lot, who 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 I couldn't just wing it and, and do crazy stuff as the offense coordinator. Because I know some guys as a, as an OC and then they become the head because they really gonna want to throw it all around a lot. You know, I, I believe in letting the defense rest. You know, giving the defense some rest time. I still put my best guys on defense. I still believe in stopping people. So some things that I did as assistant coach, I still carry as a head coach. Well, you know, people forget that's the other forgotten part is is how good Coach Spurrier's teams ran the football and, <laughs> yeah. and how balanced they really were. People forget about that sometimes. So wrapping up, that's that's really good. That that's some stuff. Those are some good nuggets, Coach. Wrapping up, what what's your pregame drink or, or your drink during the game as a head coach? What do you go with? I used to drink those buys all the time. B A I buy. Uh, I got to a point where I wanted to drink something besides water. You know, I drink so much water during practice that I want to drink something with some flavor. 
but I didn't want to have a bunch of sugar in it. You know, Gatorade had so much sugar in it, so I tried to stay away from Gatorade. So I was drinking by some, then I realized they had a little, a little bit of caffeine. I tried to stay away from caffeine. So now I drink probably uh, vitamin waters a lot. You no, know, I need something that's more like water, but has a little flavor to it. There's something that that can give me a little flavor during the game. You no, know, I go take a swig every now and again between breaks. You no, know, I usually have my little book bag on the sideline with, with my my buy, I me mean, with my um, vitamin water in it and, and a couple other things I use during the game. All right, that's good stuff. What what people are learning, what people are surprised to know, is that offensive coordinators are pretty healthy when it comes to this the drink stuff. Almost everybody I interview, not everybody, but almost everybody is health conscious and trying to stay away from a lot of stuff. Maybe it's the DCs that are that are all are just shotgun and Red Bull. Maybe that's who it is. The bangs and the monster yeah. drinks, not it. Nah, I don't do all that caffeine, man. <laughs> Good for you. I'm a huge coffee drinker, so I do have a lot of caffeine, but I try and stay away from the carbonated beverages as best I can. But, Coach, that's really good. Coach, this is this is good. i got a page full of notes already. Really appreciate having you on. If anything, you know, we can do for you, let me know. We just really appreciate you and look forward to learning more from you, and let's stay in touch. All right. Appreciate you, Coach, having me on, man. Yeah, man, absolutely. Here are winning edge takeaways and ideas for implementation. So, Josh, what are our three takeaways that you found for us this week? Well, there's some really good stuff there. I think the very first thing that stood out to me that Coach Green talked about is is wide receivers and quarterbacks meeting together and how he, he really got that from Coach Spurrier at Florida. But the, just the importance that I think we forget about sometimes of having wide receivers and skill kids understand what a quarterback's thought process is what protection is going on. That's something a lot of times we don't think about. So I thought that was really good, that idea of those guys meeting together, at least occasionally. Second point, uh, Coach Green talked about getting running backs involved in the passing game in high school. And and I've, I've said for a long time, that's something I think a lot of guys forget about. You just think of a running back who's usually one of the better athletes on your team as somebody you're just going to hand the ball to. But he talked about finding ways to get those guys involved in the passing game, and that's a great way to steal yards and steal passing yards and just get athletes in space. And then I think the third point that I really liked was Coach Green talked about needing flexible concepts. He likes concepts that are taggable, that are multiple, that you can do a lot of stuff with. He specifically, you know, he mentioned snag and drive and stick, which are kind of universal terms everybody uses, but you can do so, so many things with those patterns, and it's something that you can just build on as the season goes on without a lot of new learning. So I thought that's a great point that any high school coach can take, regardless of your offense, and apply it to the past game. Yes, I thought it was a very interesting episode, and those were three really great points there. And I think that idea that we had this elite receiver guy who played at the highest levels but learned from some great people in the passing game and now is able to filter through all of that and say, how can I apply this at the high school level? I thought he did an outstanding job in sharing that with us. So thank you again for putting this one together. And we look forward to having you back next week, Josh, for another episode of The Passing Lab. Yeah, looking forward to it, Keith. Be sure you check out Josh Herring's resources on the passing game. They are some of the best out there. I'll put a link to those. They're on CoachTube. You can find the link in the show notes. Follow all we're doing at coachingcoordinator.com. Go there for enhanced show notes. We have our winning edge takeaways detailed in text and more. Again, go to coachingcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.